Welcome, everyone. So today we're going to continue our lecture series in the history of the church through the medieval ages. Um, and specifically in this lecture, we're going to focus on what is taking place in the Byzantine Empire uh, from roughly the 8th century into uh, the 11th century, um, especially with the rise of Eastern Orthodoxy. And then what are some of the causes that leads into the Great Schism of 1054? So a uh, quick overview of the, the political and military history of the Byzantine Empire. Um, the Byzantine Empire is an extension of the Roman Empire itself, more, more specifically the eastern part of the Roman Empire. As the Roman Empire disintegrated and fell in the 5th century, the eastern empire continued to exist. And even though historians and we today call uh, this empire the Byzantine Empire, they viewed themselves as Romans and called themselves Romans. So the Byzantine Empire continued to exist and thrive in some circumstances, of course, faced a series of potential conflicts and clashes with other nearby civilizations and empires. More specifically, uh, invasions and conquests from the Muslim Arabs and Turks in the east, as well as facing uh, invasions and challenges in the Balkans from uh, the pagan Bulgars and other Slavic groups, as well as facing conflicts and challenges in Italy, from Western uh, Christian forces as well. So the Byzantine Empire uh, had a, a struggle point at the, at the beginning of the 8th century in the 700s AD. Uh, fortunately for the Byzantine Empire, Leo the Assyrian uh, took the throne in 717 AD and established the Assyrian dynasty and kind of took control of the affairs of the Byzantine Empire and set it on a stronger footing in hopes of stalling off these invasions. But what's important to note, and we'll look at here in a little bit, is that the Leo the Assyrian uh, played a key role in what was called the iconoclast controversy, which was not only a, a political but a religious controversy uh, that shook the Byzantine Empire for the next 120 years. The high point of the Byzantine civilization was during the Macedonian dynasty, which came after the Azurian and the Amorian dynasty, um, which was founded by Basil I in 867. The Macedonian dynasty uh, was, like I said, the cultural high point. Um, it was a golden age intellectually, economically, politically, culturally for the Byzantines. Uh, the Byzantines were able to reconquer uh, parts of Asia Minor, Armenia, Syria, as well as in uh, re, uh, conquering parts of the Balkans and uh, reclaiming key territory and holding, maintaining a foothold in southern Italy, as well as not only politically, but, relig but religiously, they uh, had a massive missions movement um, during this point with the spread and conversions of like the pagan Bulgars, Serbian Slavs, Romanians, and especially the Russians. So there was a massive uh, Eastern Orthodox missions movement that occurred during the Macedonian dynasty. And the Macedonian dynasty established the Byzantine Empire as one of the uh, important significant powers in the, the uh, European Mediterranean world as European civilizations and Islamic civilizations kind of looked to the Byzantine Empire as kind of the cultural high point. After the Great Schism, and we'll look about this in other lectures, there is a significant decline that the Byzantines go through. But in the context of these of looking at the history of the church in the East, just know that during this point, we reach kind of this the high point of culture and advancement for the Byzantines as we look at these different controversies and conflicts. Now, Eastern Orthodox worship. Um, what's unique about the Eastern Orthodox worship is that if you go to an Eastern Orthodox church today, you'll find that the worst pattern of worship and the worship style hasn't changed in the last thousand years. Uh, it has been consistent. There has been a few adjustments here and there, but really it's been traditionally the same. It's been consistent. So when you walk in and you see the church, one some things you'll notice is that one, there's no pews like you find in a Catholic church or a Protestant church. There's no pulpits. There's no musical instruments, no organs. But what you do find a whole lot of is icons, images of Christ, of Mary, the saints or angels in a kind of flat 2D shape or a mosaic shape, um, just compounding on the walls, the ceilings of, of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, and we'll talk about the significance of the icons here in a second as well. Just also know that as you walk in, 
you're confronted with uh, a wall near towards the end of the church, and that's called the iconostasis. It's kind of a massive icon wall that has three doors of entry uh, representing the Trinity, uh, the main one being the, the God, the Father, which is the center door. Uh, clergy are the only ones allowed through that door. And on the other side, you have kind of what's called the altar. It's the sanctuary portion of, of, the, um, of the church. And inside is where the holy table resides, and the holy table is consecrated by the relics of, of the saints of the Eastern Orthodox. Um, it's where the communion is conducted. Uh, it's where the gospel is, uh, the uh, candles, the two candles, the crucifix. Um, so it's a it's kind of the uh, the sacred place of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Now, during worship practices, what's common is that uh, you'll stand as a congregation during uh, during worship, during a liturgy, even during communion itself. And communion is is done in in, in a similar vein to uh, to the Roman Catholic tradition as well, except for that it's uh, you there's a special spoon that that contains the bread that the congregation will participate in in the communion service. Bread and wine is supplied by the worshipers. What's also unique is that during the liturgy, all right, it's not there. It's not an anarchic liturgy in which uh, which people can kind of do their own thing. But there are certain parts of the liturgy. Uh, individuals have the freedom to participate in the worship service by you know going to particular icons that they feel devoted to or drawn to, and sense to venerate and communicate with the divine behind those images. During the worship service, too, what's what you'll notice is that there's a strong incense uh, portion. You know, you're kind of hit with the senses of the smell as you go into the Eastern Orthodox Church, because the icons are receiving their incense. They're being they're being sensed in a sense that uh, that the, you're offering incense to the divine behind the images, and so sensing is part of the liturgy of worship in the uh, the Eastern Orthodox. Like I also mentioned, there's no musical instruments. So the singing is done in what's called an antiphony. What that is, is you'll have a person or choir sing a portion of the song, and there's another person or choir that counter that kind of uh, sings the counterbalancing act of the song. So it's one portion and another one sings another portion after that. So this, like I said, the Eastern Orthodox Church has a very uh, traditional view of worship and un an unchanging worship pattern for the last thousand years that has really been consistent in how it worships. Now, so looking at some of the controversies, uh, and these controversies are important because one of the things that takes place is, like I said, the split between Eastern and Western Church. Why does the split take place? Well, one is the iconoclastic controversy. During the 8th, 9th century, so from roughly the 700s to the mid-800s AD, there was a debate over the use of these icons in the Eastern Church. Icons have been a pattern in the Eastern Church roughly around the 4th and 5th century. We do find evidence of images in old church house buildings, but they're mostly biblical narratives like images of Noah's Ark and things like that, uh, a lamb. And there's also symbology we find the, uh, the, the fish, the cross. So these, these imagery have existed, but the worship and veneration of these images was not a mainstream part of the early church. But they do develop in the East and extend even further in the East. Now, what causes this iconoclastic controversy to take place is the Islamic invasion and the response by the Roman, the Byzantine emperors to this invasion. Just a key on terms here, when the term iconoclast means someone who opposes icons, the term iconophile or iconodual means someone who's in favor of icons. So if you don't like icons, you're iconoclast. If you do like icons, um, and a supporter of venerating icons, you're a conophile or an iconodule. Now, Emperor Leo, who founded the Azurian dynasty in 717, Emperor Leo opposed the use of icons within the Eastern Church. The reason that historians give to this is possibility of the, those Islamic invasions in the Eastern part of the, of the Byzantine Empire. 
Leo the Assyrian viewed the victories that the Islamic forces were having as divine favor. Remember, early Christian writers and apologists viewed Islam as more of a Christian heresy and saw that there must have been a divine favor for this group. And the reason why is because they don't use icons or images in their worship. In fact, they oppose it. They oppose icons and images in worship. And so Leo de Surian decides that that's the problem that needs to be corrected, is that now we need to remove icons and images from the church. He has the support of the army that, um, that of course, wants to have favored victories in battle. Um, but he's faced by opposition from the general public and the monks who maintain that spirituality, that inner spiritual experience with God. And of course, we're drawn to the use of icons. So there was a conflict there in the in the 700s between Leo and the general public. And it's continued even further by his son, Constantine V. What's interesting is that during this controversy, this iconoclast controversy, which was extremely brutal, uh, in which Monks were, monasteries were destroyed, monks were forced to marry nuns as a uh, uh, kind of a diabolical act enforced by Constantine V, um, was that during this, during this controversy, the papacy in the West, the, the Bishop of Rome, actually supported the iconophiles. Um, the reason being is that, as we'll see constantly, the, the Bishop of Rome is looking towards um, increasing their own power over the patriarch of Constantinople, increasing their own authority over the Eastern Church, as well as undermining the power of the Eastern Roman Emperor, the Byzantine Emperor. So the papacy is always looking to enhance their own authority. So the, theologically, they make support for the iconophiles, but there's also a kind of a political pragmatic reasoning as to why the papacy comes out in support of the iconophiles. Now, policy changes with the Empress Irene, uh, who was kind of the uh, the daughter-in-law to Constantine V. Um, she takes over the imperial throne after her husband dies and uses her son as kind of a puppet and appoints herself in the sense as the Empress. She even blinds her own son to maintain her power and authority. So not a positive figure, but nonetheless, uh, she orders an ecumenical council uh, of the Second Council of Nicaea in 787. Now, I talked about this in my last lecture. Charlemagne was upset because even though it was declared ecumenical, none of the Frankish bishops actually got to attend uh, this council. And so Charlemagne had his own uh, his own agenda after the results of this council. But regardless, the Second Council of Nicaea in 787 sets forth the standard of, of how icons should be worshipped and venerated in the Eastern Church. Ultimately, that worship is solely given to God but icons can be venerated because the saints have been changed ontologically and therefore represent the divine and can be venerated, uh, but not receive worship due, uh, due to uh, only to God. Uh, there is still kind of a, a, a blanket period and kind of a second phase of the iconoclast controversy, but it kind of comes to a final head and is the, the result of the second account, Council of Nicaea in 787, is reaffirmed later on with Empress Theodora in, eight, in the Synod of Constantinople in 843. And this is declared the triumph of the Orthodoxy, where icons are now the official established view of a uh, official part of the Eastern Orthodox Church. So laying down the arguments, what, what are the theological arguments for the use of icons? And so I'm going to present both sides, and that way you can decide your, your own view and arguments on this. Um, as a Protestant, obviously leaning more towards the iconoclast uh, arguments, but nonetheless, giving you both sides and both perspectives of how they viewed each key issue. The first issue, obviously, is the second commandment. You know, you shall not make false. You know, shall not make. Uh, you know, false images. What? Um, so, the, with the second commandment, how does the iconoclast and the iconophile approach the second commandment? Well, the iconoclast obviously argues that the second commandment is very clear. You now shall not make images that includes icons and that um, that in a sense, also the iconoclast, those who oppose icons, the only true acceptable icons of God or, or, or Christ is the, the bread and wine in the Eucharist, as well as the crucifix or making the Cairo symbol. Those are the only acceptable imagery that can be used 
uh, because those are tied with, with Christ. Now, the iconophiles argue in a different sense. One is that the iconophile argument is that the second commandment was, spe- was in a sense, specific to the Old Testament, um, and it's more specifically towards the, the, the uh, use of pagan idols and pagan images for worship. Because in the Old Testament, it's impossible to create an image of God. Of course, the iconophiles will argue too, saying that there were sanctioned images and icons of God with the Ark of the Covenant or the tabernacle uh, material or the bronze serpent. Then the iconophiles argued that this changed with the uh, coming of Christ, that Christ, with, uh, with Christ coming, now uh, there can be, in a sense, images of God uh, because now there is the true image of God with Christ. The their ultimate argument, as they kind of bring it bring it together and kind of and symbolically, is that the iconophile will argue that that the that what they're doing is that much like a man loving his wife, love man loves his wife, a husband loves his wife, but has affection for a picture of his wife. He doesn't necessarily love the picture. He loves his wife, but will have an affection for the picture. It's the same idea in their argument that. We don't love the icons, but we have affection for the icon because what it represents the person that we love, which is God. So that would be the iconophile position. So what about portraying Christ as a man? And it ties in kind of with the second, with the with understanding of the second commandment, is that with the coming of Christ in his incarnate form, the iconoclast would argue that that Christ is the only acceptable image of God in his in in his in incarnated state. His human in his human nature, therefore, no other images are necessary. Not even images of Christ, because they are not true images. While Christ, in his physical human nature, is the true representation. Now, the iconophiles would uh, argue that that's by not having images of Christ, we deny or uh, or in a sense damage or misunderstand or misrepresent his human nature and and ultimately uh ultimately reduce the significance of his human nature and then focusing more too much on the divine nature so that would be the iconophiles position in class with the iconoclast position well what about early church practices this is the actually the strongest iconoclast argument too in that the early church traditions did not use icons in worship. There's no record, no documentation of use of icons or imagery. In fact, there are some letters where some early church fathers uh, condemn the worshiping of certain images. Now, the iconophiles will turn to an unwritten tradition in the early church as an argument for the support of the use of icons. And then finally, icons as an educational tool. So, the iconoclast would argue that the use of icons can lead to idolatry, and it, the uneducated would remain uneducated in a sense because now instead of understanding what is the purpose of these icons and imagery, they will then in turn just simply worship the icons and imagery, believing that they are empowered versus going to God or trusting in Christ. The iconophiles uh, argue that that it that an image. It's just like a book. Whether or not you read the words or look at a picture, it still creates the image in your mind and is treated just the same. So if regardless if the uneducated person learns to read or learns by the use of imagery, in a sense, it still creates the mental image in the mind. Um, and so it can be used as an educational tool for the uneducated. So these are kind of the layouts of the arguments and understanding. Of course, it goes even further than this, but this is kind of a good summary and overview of what are some of the tangible theological arguments from the iconoclast and the iconophile positions. So what about what was going on in the West? What did the Western church think of these iconoclast controversies? And like I said, the papacy supported the iconophile position. The the Western church never had an equivalent to the controversy like the iconoclast. There was no debate about the use of images in the Western church. The Western church actually didn't have a problem with the use of images. Now they weren't elevated to the same status as they are in the Eastern church. They are adopted and brought in, 
but relics gain actually a far greater significance in the Western church than icons or images do. And what ends up happening is that the images become three-dimensional statues that we see very common in Roman Catholicism today, and that points to the Eastern Orthodox Church accusing the Western Church of falling into idolatry because they have images in the round instead of flat to the images, uh, which is which kind of uh, helps balance their argument on worshiping uh, imagery and idolatry in, in their viewpoint. So that was one particular controversy. And like I said, so we see there kind of an, an early split with the papacy and the Western church going one way with the use of icons and the Eastern church going another. So we now we run into another controversy that takes place within the Eastern church, but also involves the Western church. And this is known as the Filioque controversy, or also known as the Phocian schism. <clears throat> so, Phocius uh, was an important figure from who lived from 820 to 895 AD. Uh, he was born into an iconophile family, a family that supported the use of icons. Uh, his family and himself were persecuted by iconoclast emperors, like Emperor Theophilus. And, uh, but Phocius, uh, nonetheless, uh, was able to gain access and attend the University of Constantinople. Um, he was taught by Leo the Mathematician, and Photius became known for his wide range in intellect, um, his deep knowledge, especially in the areas of theology. Though Photius himself really wanted to focus on a secular career in the imperial court. He took different positions, such as a civil servant, a diplomat, and a lecturer. So he wasn't really looking for being part of the clergy or being a part of the Eastern Orthodox Church in, in, uh, in leading it. But ultimately, Emperor Michael III was looking for someone to replace the current patriarch, Patriarch of Ignatius, who ran afoul of Emperor Michael III. So Michael III deposed Ignatius as the patriarch and appointed Photius to be the new patriarch. The, the funny thing is that, <clears throat> is that Photius had, uh, had not been in any ordained role. He wasn't an ordained clergyman in the Eastern Orthodox Church. So in one day, he quickly went through all the different positions to become finally become the patriarch of Constantinople. <clears throat> the problem with this appointment was it it kind of rubbed rubbed the wrong way for Ignatius supporters who viewed Photius as a usurper and were looking to undermine Photius's authority, which is what draws in the papacy to now be involved in this uh, in this election conflict of the patriarch of Constantinople. So, like I said earlier, the papacy is always looking to undermine the authority of the emperor, as well as gain authority over the Eastern Orthodox Church. And so in this kind of schism, in, this fo in the Phocian schism that takes place, <clears throat> the Pope, Nicholas I, has an agenda. One is uh, he sends papal ambassadors to investigate the election of the Patriarch of Constantinople, to, in to investigate the election of Photius. So one is the ambassadors are meant to determine whether or not Photius has claimed to be in the Patriarch. And Pope Nicholas is looking to undermine that and replace Photius and maybe have his own player or have Ignatius support, therefore claiming more support that the papacy has authority in the elections. The second agenda is that Pope Nicholas is looking for gaining control of Latin lands in southern Italy that are under the control of the Byzantines. And so hoping to gain a little bit of expansion of, of papal authority in the south of Italy. Uh, the ambassadors arrive at Constantinople, and with, depending on which viewpoint you take, uh, some argue that they were bribed. Um, but regardless, the papal ambassadors agree that Photius had right to replace Ignatius, and they kind of they they don't argue for Pope Nicholas's agenda about the uh, the issues of land and control in southern Italy, and so kind of, and so Pope Nicholas loses on both fronts. And in kind of an, an upset rage, excommunicates Photius. Uh, so we have the first kind of major excommunication of the Patriarch of Constantinople with the Phocian schism. Uh, <clears throat> but Emperor Michael III really just ignores the excommunication and, lead, and lets Photius continue to be the Patriarch of Constantinople. Now, um, what causes Photius to excommunicate the West and excommunicate the uh, the Western Catholic Church is a cause of, of rivalry for the missions movement um, 
in the in the region of Bul- Bulgaria today. <clears throat> so there was a there was a Roman Western uh, uh, Catholic missions force in Bulgaria as well as the Eastern Orthodox missions force in Bulgaria, each trying to persuade the Bulgars over to their view of Christianity. Now, conflict arises between these two groups because of the use of the filioque clause in the Nicene Creed for the West. Now, I talked about this somewhat in the previous lecture, but the filioque clause is simply an update to the Nicene Creed. Remember, the Nicene Creed dealt with the Trinity um, and understanding where does the son's relationship to the father and in their div- in the divine nature. And so one part of the Nicene Creed, though, speaks of the Holy Spirit. In the original Nicene Creed, it says that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. And in the West, the emphasis began to change as there was there is now a focus on the Son. So the Holy so in the Western tradition for the Nicene Creed, it was added that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and from the Son. So the Holy Spirit proceeds from both. Photius denounced this filioque clause that was added to the Nicene Creed as heretical. One is the argument that the Western church can't make a unilateral change to the Nicene Creed, which is an ecumenical creed across all churches without, in a sense, another ecumenical council making that update. Um, so they can't unilaterally do this. And second off, that he would argue that it's it's um, heretical from a theological standpoint. So looking at the filioque clause, in, in its theological terms. There's really what it comes down to is different perspectives of how one views the Trinity. And this kind of continues today between the East and Western churches, even Protestants and the Eastern Orthodox is how we come to view God. So the Eastern view is that ultimately the you start by you start by studying God by knowing the persons of God. You look at the the unity of the Trinity is found in the persons of the Trinity and the sense that the Father is the kind of the fountainhead of the deity is the sole source of the divine nature um and so the father so from the father the son and the holy spirit come they both proceed from the father not in the sense that they're not equal with the father um but where the sense of their natures and their essences um these like i said the east focuses on that while in the west the focus is starting with not the persons of the Trinity, but the divine nature, the, the attributes that God possesses. And so, and so, and then you move on into the person. So if you look at like at Western systematic theology, it always starts with the divine attributes before moving into the persons of the Trinity. Um, and there, like I said, there was a strong emphasis in the West for the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and from the Son, because there was a strong emphasis on making sure that the Son was equal to the Father. Um, and and so there was that emphasis there. And so there was, like I said, it was kind of different perspectives on how to view the Trinity. And that's still today uh, kind of a deciding factor um, in the Eastern views versus the Western views of how one approaches understanding God and the Trinity. Now, uh, Photius excommunicates Pope Nicholas over the filioque clause. So now you have kind of dual excommunications. It doesn't last. Ultimately, Photius is replaced uh, when Basil I of the Macedonian dynasty takes the throne. He removes Photius and reappoints Ignatius, which interestingly, he doesn't last long. He dies. Photius comes back to being the patriarch of Constantinople, and then he's deposed again after a short time. Uh, during this time, Photius becomes well known for his writing and his defense in opposition to the filioque clause and really shaping that thought in the Eastern Orthodox Church. But this schism, this kind of short lived schism, uh, is a kind of a prelude to what happens later on in 1054. So we see here the groundworks, whether with the iconoclastic controversy and the filioque controversy, differences. That begin to that begin to stand out between the Eastern and Western Church. That causes that breakdown of the relationship between the Western Church and the Eastern Church. So culturally, what's taking place in the East in the Eastern Orthodox Church is the expansion of the Byzantine monasteries. There are monastic movements. Um, and the monastic movement initially originally uh, originated in the East, like I've talked about in other lectures. But what's interesting is that unlike in the West, where there's different monastic orders. 
in the East, there's all, they're all one order. They all kind of follow the same teaching and guidelines of Basil Caesarea, one of the Cappadocian fathers in the fourth century. There are many different important monasteries, but I'm really just going to kind of focus it down to two. You have um, the Studium in Constantinople, which was kind of the monastic headquarters of the Eastern Orthodox Church. And you had then uh, Mount Athos in Greece, uh, which is unique and has a kind of unique story behind it in that supposedly that's where Mary set foot on her journeys. And when she stepped foot on Mount Athos, all the pagan statues uh, fell down. And so from then on, women were prohibited from ever setting foot in kind of honor of Mary on Mount Athos. Even to this day, women are no are in no way, shape or form allowed on Mount Athos. And there's been some record of monks who like who won, for instance, in the turn of the 20th century was orphaned as a child, um, as a baby at Mount Athos, and was raised there as a monk, lived his whole life in the monastery, never once laid eyes on a woman. Um, supposedly by the 11th century, nearly 40,000 monks lived around Mount Athos. Um, now it's only about 1,000, but still, like I said, it's a primary hub of, of the monastic movement. Um, and monks play an important role in the theological development, as we'll see also in, in further discussions of the Eastern Orthodox Church in later lectures, um, in the shaping of the spirituality and the thinking of the Eastern Orthodox Church. One such important figure was named uh, Simeon the New Theologian, who lived from 949 to 1022, um, considered one of the greatest mystics and, and monks of the Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, originally wanted to seek a career in uh, civil service in the secular court, but changed it for living a life of monasticism. Um, he was known for his very deep piety, his inner spirituality. Uh, he joined the studium in Constantinople, but unfortunately for him, he kind of gained, ran afoul of some of the leadership of, of the studium for his strictness and his deepness for ex of, of having a personal experience with God. And so was removed from studium, had to leave and go to uh, St. Mamas Monastery in Constantinople, where he was made the abbot of, of that monastery. And he was known for his many works and his writings on, on the practical spirituality of being a, of being a Christian. Um, some of the things that he really focused in on was, one is that he, he opposed nominal Christianity, which he saw as a major problem in the Eastern Orthodox Church, that people were just kind of going through the motions really didn't have a deep care or a deep sense of being a Christian and was known for his very strict sense of worship. Um, but what he radiated was supposedly this light from his worship. Uh, he was known for his prophetic abilities. He was known for his weeping of tears for repentance uh, on a spot. He can just weep and, and crying and emotion for repentance. And so this all demonstrated the power of his personal piety and and one of the things, like I said, is he argued the significance of that personal experience with God. That's all in, in the experiential relationship that one should have with God through means like prayer, like having a deep prayer life. Um, he ultimately still ran afoul of the clergy at Constantinople because there was kind of a conflict of authority between the organized clergy and the monastic leadership in Constantinople. And so was ultimately forced to uh, to leave Constantinople. Despite that, um, he was known well known in the Eastern Orthodox Church. He was very well admired. So when after he dies in 1022, he receives the title of the New Theologian. So Simeon, the New Theologian. That title is only other given to uh, John the Apostle and uh, one of the Cappadocian Fathers in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Now, so there are in this time period, too, um, dissenting movements that's recorded by different Eastern Orthodox theologians. They're all kind of grouped together uh, under the title of the Manichees. And like I mentioned earlier in, the, in a previous lecture, the Manichees appeared in the fourth century, roughly sec, uh, third, fourth century, under the prophet, Persian prophet Mani, who took different ideas of, from Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, uh, Platonism, and Christianity, and Gnosticism, kind of formed this amalgamated religion together where there's a force between light and dark. The dark created the evil matter with all the physical matter, which is evil, and the light is all the spiritual and good, and that each individual has this internal balance and internal fight 
between the forces of light and dark within themselves. And you must purify yourself of the darkness to support the side of the light. You can do that through your use of reason, um, as well as rejection of things of the material, such as being married, eating meat, things like that, having following strict ascetic worship practices. So these two groups that we're going to look at kind of were also included as Manichees because they have that similar Gnostic element to them that we'll see dealing with the physical being evil, the spiritual being good. So the first group is the called the Paulicians. And they existed in Armenia since the 7th century, and they exist all the way into the 19th century. Uh, so they had a long history of exi existing as a kind of dissenting group. And like the Manichees, they rejected all the physical elements of the world as being created by an evil god versus a good god. Um, and kind of like the Marcionites, they rejected certain aspects of the scripture. They rejected the Old Testament, um, and they only accepted the Gospels and certain writings of Paul. And so they had a very strict focus and aesthetic practices uh, that tied to them. What's interesting is that they were constantly persecuted by the Eastern Orthodox Church and always went defended uh, with the Muslims against the Byzantine Empire. Now, uh, one interesting group I think is really interesting is the Bogo Mills. That was another dissenting group. Um, they also had a dualistic belief. Now, their belief kind of comes from, in a sense, that there, there is one God and that God had two sons, Christ, and then another one named Satanael or Centineal, um, and that Centineal was this evil, evil cre creature and who created the world, created the universe in, in sin and fallenness and trapped fallen angels inside human bodies. And so Christ was then sent to free humans, uh, but ultimately was killed and then resurrected. And so then provides, and then so Christ promises to provide his people the eternal spirit to free them from their physical bodies. And so in this belief, in this belief group, they denied the Old Testament, just like the Paulicians. They, and just like the Manichees before them, they also denied marriage. They denied the physical aspects of worship. The Bogle Mills influence, though, will spread to the West, and we'll look at in later lectures uh, a dissenting group known as the Cathars that um, that are some in some ways tied to the Bogle Mills. There's some historians trying to make some connection between them um, and how they shape the thought of the Cathars, uh, and we'll talk about that later on in a different lecture. Uh, but the Bogle Mills died out after their conquest by the Turks in 1393. What's also interesting is that the Orthodox theologians take note that with these dissenting groups, that they are really known for their purity and their lifestyles. But we always have to remember that that purity and lifestyle is not, in a sense, the essence of true Christianity. It's the proper faith in Jesus Christ and the salvation found in Jesus Christ that is true Christianity. Um, purity of life does not mean that one is a Christian. It's who you've placed your faith in and that you bear fruit of the spirit. And that fruit will demonstrate in, in a pure lifestyle, but that is not the essence of you being saved. It's who you place your faith and trust in. So once again, it's important to even in modern day to under, make sure that we understand as Christians, what is the, what is the focal point of our faith and our belief? So the Byzantines also were active in the missions movement. I kind of mentioned that earlier. Uh, they sought to expand the Eastern Orthodox Church northwards and westwards. They were actually kind of invited by the Slavs of Moravia uh, to present their view of Christendom. And so Emperor Michael III sent Cyr uh, Cyril and Methodius to Moravia to help uh, expand the Eastern Orthodox Church in those lands. Uh, what's important about these two guys, Cyril and Methodius, is that they developed uh, the first Slavonic alphabet uh, known as Cyrillic today. And this helps shape the language of Eastern Europe. You, the, the essence of all Eastern European languages, whether Romanian, Serbian, Russian, Ukrainian, uh, all tie back to the Slavic alphabet, the Cyrillic. And these two brothers, Cyril and Methodius, really focused in on uh, evangelizing uh, the Moravian Slavs. Unfortunately, they ran afoul of the Western Catholic missions movement that was there and were forced to flee Moravia uh, later on. So we're un unsuccessful in converting the Moravians over to the Eastern Orthodox Church. 
However, there were other successful areas of conversion. One was the Bulgarians. Um, Moravian missionaries began to evangelize the Bulgarians there. Uh, Tsar Boris accepted the Eastern Orthodox Church in 865. There was a short stint of returning back to paganism under Tsar Vladimir, uh, but his successor, Tsar Simeon, brings it back to the Eastern Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox Church after that. What's important to note, to take note of here, is the differences in in uh in the missions movement between the uh western christian christendom versus the eastern orthodox church in the the western catholic missions sought to when they sought to expand the church and christianize nearby neighbors they also sought to bring them under the authority of the papacy bring them under the authority of the bishop of rome the eastern orthodox church in a sense, didn't have that agenda. There, they established, in a sense, a national Orthodox Church for those particular people. So there was a Bulgarian Orthodox Church. There's a Serbian Orthodox Church. There's a Ukrainian Orthodox Church. So these, it's not that their own, their own individual. There are, in a sense, their own individual entities, but they're all connected together in this kind of commonwealth. So a way to understand this time period too is that there's a Byzantine Commonwealth that exists. Even though there's, there's the Byzantine Empire and different kingdoms and empires and nations, they're all tied together in this Commonwealth through the Eastern Orthodox Church. So we see the the birth of the Bulgarian Patriarchate taking place here with the beginning of these Eastern missions movement, and we see it replicated in other uh, kingdoms and groups of people in the Eastern Europe. So, for example, like Serbia, which was continued to be evangelized by a Cyril Methodius. Uh, and we'll look at in a later lecture, too, there was a great struggle for authority over the Serbian church between Western Catholic and Eastern Orthodox. But ultimately, Eastern Orthodox would, would win out. This allowed for the formation of a strong Serbian Slavonic culture. And thanks to the Cyril's work in the Cyrillic alphabet, the Slavonic alphabet coming to Serbia to help establish that strong Serbian Slavonic culture. There was also continued evangelism in Romania and Greece. Some of you also might take a note that I haven't mentioned Russia. Russia gets its own separate um, lecture as well later on for its missions movement. We'll talk about them later, but we're really focusing on the nearby neighbors of the Byzantine Empire. So Romania is brought into the Eastern Orthodox fold. What's unique about Romania is that it was once part of the Roman Empire. It was known as Dacia, so it has roots in Latin. Um, even though uh, later on Slavic people settle in the area and intermingle, so there is a Slavic Latin-based language and culture that is influent that influences Romania to this day. Um, Christianity was present within the uh, within Romania since the second century, but Orthodox missionaries helped bring it into the fold, establishing that uh, Romanian Orthodox Church as well. Greece itself also experiences a revitalization in the Eastern Orthodox Church, which seems kind of strange to most people. But at one point, during the low uh, point of the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, during the low point of the Byzantine Empire, um, Slavs began to move in and settle into Greece, and so to convert these pagan Slavs over, uh, Byzantine emperors sent missionaries like Nikon the Pendant to convert uh, the pagan Slavs who settled in Greece over to the Eastern Orthodox Church as well. So there was a massive, like I said, expansion during this high point, cultural high point of the Eastern Orthodox Church into nearby kingdoms and nations and peoples. So the schism, how and why does the schism take place? So we kind of looked at it earlier with the different controversies, the Filioque controversy, um, the Iconoclast controversy, the Phocian schism, all these things uh, are are cutting at the threads of unity between the Eastern and Western church. There are some significant differences that cause the schism. One is, um, which takes, pl takes place even early before the fall of the Roman empire, significantly just the differences in culture. The Western Roman empire was Latin based while the Eastern Roman empire was Greek based. And this language and cultural, uh, cult and cultural sense that was tied to both languages helped split it apart even further. So, in essence, before the fall of the Roman Empire, it wasn't a sure thing, but that, that that emphasis of that separation between East and West would play a role in helping that divide to grow further and further. But what really kind of sets, sets it forward in the splitting between the East and West church is the essence of authority, who possesses authority. 
The Bishop of Rome, the Pope, always seemed to want to claim authority over the entirety of the church and has always laid claim to that argument um, uh, since, uh, you know, since the fourth century to the present and has always sought to, in some ways, undermine the other patriarchs and establish their own authority over um, over the other patriarchs. Uh, we do see contradictions, for example, like Gregory the Great opposed the idea of an ecumenical uh, bishop, like when uh, when the emperor, Byzantine emperor, wanted to make the patriarch of Constantinople declare the ecumenical bishop of the entire Christendom. Um, and Gregory the Great said that anybody who takes the idea, takes the term ecumenical bishop is an, is an antichrist. Um, so we do see counterclaims to that idea, but in, but in essence, the Bishop of Rome has always sought to establish and exalt themselves over the authority of the entirety of the church. And this counteracted with what the East viewed and the Eastern Orthodox Church viewed um, that the five ancient patriarchs are an equal to one another um, and that they should work in tandem with one another, not have authority and exalt themselves over the authority of the other patriarchs. And so we have, a, in a sense, a clash of church authority that plays a role in the tearing and splitting of the Eastern and Western parts of the church. Another is just, just simply different religious practices. And like I said, this ties back to culture, um, emphasis of marriage. One is that in the West, a clergy were uh, prohibited from being married. Um, even though this, even though it, uh, it won't be official until the Fourth Lateran Council, uh, because Western clergy members still continue to be married until the Fourth Lateran Council, when really it's repressed and opposed. Um, in the Eastern Church, um, it, it's acceptable for to be married as long as you're married before you're ordained. Um, there's different types of bread used in communion, unleavened bread in the West, leavened bread in the East, different baptism practices. Uh, in the East, you're immersed fully three times uh, in representation of the Trinity, um, while sprinkling was only necessary in the West. Uh, so you have different baptism practices, so different forms of worship and also different forms of liturgy that plays a role in that separation between East and West. And then finally, the big one, and I know my, my head's partly cutting off some part of the information, is the theological differences between East and West. We already kind of looked at that with the Trinity, right? Different orientation and perspectives, uh, perspectives of how to understand the Trinity. And it's the same way with looking at other theological issues between East and West, different orientation and perspectives of how to address things like sin and salvation. So, for example, uh, in the West, the West denies, uh, not the West, the in the West uh, practices the idea of purgatory and indulgences, while the East denies the existence of purgatory and even the concept of indulgences. The West is shaped by the teachings of Augustine, less so in the East. So there's a strong emphasis on, on the legal terms and understanding of original sin. And that when Adam fell, the sin and guilt of Adam passed to the po his posterity. In the East, it wasn't that original sin, the sin and guilt of Adam passed on, but death itself was what was transmitted and sent to his offspring. And so salvation in the West is viewed as a deliverance from the, that guilt and depravity of sin. While in the East, salvation is more seen from the from the objective power of death. It's liberation from death. Not not it's also liberation from sin, but the primary focus is a liberation from death. In the West, death is seen as the consequence of sin, while sin in the East is seen as the consequence of death. And there's also different emphasis of Christ's uh, accomplishments. Uh, Christ dealt with sin in the West and therefore conquered death. While in the East, it's focused that Christ conquered death and therefore dealt with sin. And that's represented in imagery, too. There's a strong emphasis of the cross and its work of atonement in the West, while in the East, there's a much stronger emphasis on the incarnation and resurrection. So we do have theological differences, and like I said, differences in understanding the Trinity as well. Um, and so... There's just, like I said, different perspectives and orientation of one, how one approaches the aspects of sin, death, and salvation in the Eastern Orthodox Church versus, versus the West. And like I said, it also comes down to terminology. While the West has a much more Latin-based legal understanding of church and salvation, while 
the uh, the Eastern Church approaches this on ontological terms. Now, once again, this doesn't mean that in the West there's no emphasis on incarnation or resurrection, and doesn't mean the East doesn't have emphasis on the cross. It's just what is kind of the priority of observance and and how one views those particular aspects. So what leads to the schism? What are the actual events that lead to the schism? So we looked at the underlying controversies and differences between East and West, and we can see that there are some, in a sense, extreme differences, but it's also differences of perspective and in orientation. So the final split happens due to a military conflict. Um, the Normans, we're going to look at next time, were a kind of a subset Viking group that settled in Normandy, France, and were campaigning in England and parts of the Mediterranean, and especially in Italy and Sicily, setting up their own kingdom there. So these Norman Vikings uh, were, were expanding into Byzantine lands in southern Italy. And so to, to stay off this invasion, the Byzantines were looking for support from Rome to provide a military force to help prevent the expansion of the Normans. The Ro the, the Bishop of Rome, uh, the, the Pope, uh, said, fine, we'll support you against the Normans, but you have to acknowledge me, the Pope, as superior to the Patriarch of Constantinople. Emperor Constantine IX said, that's fine, we'll do it, and so demanded that Patriarch Sir Hilarius, uh, uh appoint um, uh, appoint of uh, the bishop as superior now ultimately emperor sir Lair uh, patriarch sir Laria said nope not going to do it and uh closed down the land churches in uh the land churches in around constantinople so so the patriarch sir Laria closed down the land churches and ultimately uh and ultimately refused to acquiesce to the demands of the Bishop of Rome. And so the Pope sent Cardinal Humbert over with letters demanding submission or facing excommunication. When Patriarch Solarius said no, Cardinal Humbert delivered on the tables in Hagia Sophia the letters of excommunication for Patriarch Solarius, who in turn anathematized and excommunicated the Western Church. And so then in 1054, we have the official split between Eastern and Western churches. There were attempts at reconciliation. We see those attempts um, after the Fourth Crusade and before the fall of Constantinople in 1453. Unfortunately, those attempts of reconciliation fall apart, um, and we won't see an official reconciliation until 1965, when both the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church remove their excommunications and anathematations, anathematations against each other. But still, nonetheless, these Eastern, the Eastern Church and the Western Church have not reunited since. I thank you all for joining me on this lecture and viewing of the Eastern Orthodox Church. We're still going to have a later discussion of the other half of the Eastern Orthodox Church in the Byzantine Empire up into the fall of Constantinople. Hope you have a wonderful day and God bless.